value depends on several things which I just showed you, right? It depends on the variance and the mean of the samples. It depends on the significance level alpha you choose. Okay. And I showed you, I thought, I tried to show you in that table how for this C value might move around a little bit as a function of different things. Okay. So I showed you here, sorry. The C value is a, would be a function, for example, a number of samples and the significance level that'll move this value around. But the basic idea I go, I'm going the wrong way, I'm sorry. So the basic idea is, okay, there's the value we want it to be, and if it's a little bit less than that, that's okay, but if it gets too much less than that, as defined by this critical value, then that's too much less, and after that, we'll reject hypothesis, okay? And the, the advantage of doing it the way we're doing it, there's a firm statistical basis for what we're doing, right? Like, this isn't just some random decision, like if it's 198, you could do something stupid like that, right? You could say, well, if I get 10 samples and they average 198 or less, I'm just rejecting it. And someone would say, what's the basis for that? And you're just like, 198 seems like too small, you know? So this puts it all on a firm statistical basis or grounds. And so this is called a, a left-sided test here, okay? You could do the same thing with a right-sided test. This would be where you're concerned that the mean is actually greater than you've been told or hypothesized. So there's the hypothesized value. If it's less than that, you could care less. If it's a little bit greater, it's okay. But if it gets to be above this critical value C, that's too much. You, and you, then you don't no longer believe that that's the mean. Okay? You reject the hypothesis at that point. Or you could do what was suggested um, by one of the students is that you might be concerned both ways. So this is a so-called two-sided. So th if this is the thin film thickness, you might be concerned if it's too small, too thin, or too thick. Okay, that's a two-sided, and if you do a two-sided test, you, gotta, you have to calculate two val critical values of C, okay? One that represents the critical value for it being too small, and one that corresponds to it being critical value too large. And then only, so you find these C values, you calculate your t-statistic thing, and then in that case, you would reject the hypothesis if it was too low and too high, so if you go back, Nobody's drawing these pictures, so I'm going to flip around arbitrarily. So if you have, see, th we had the picture look like this because we were worried about the mean being too small, so we're worried about this tail over here, reject hypothesis. If we're worried about it too big, we'd have a tail over there that we're worried about. The C value would be here. That would be the accept region, the reject region would be over here. And then if you're worried about being too small or too large, you're worried about the tail here and the tail over there. Okay? And only in the middle would you reject hypothesis. This value here would be called C1, and this value over here would be C2. And then the area, I don't think I have a picture of this, but if you had a two side, if you had a sig alpha value of <coughs> 5%, if you have just a left-handed alternative, the area here is 5%. If you have a right hand, it's 5%. But if you have a two-sided, each area will be 2.5%, so they add up to 5%. All right. Uh, okay. So these are the alternatives. So for a particular problem, you have to either decide what the alternative is. Obviously, if I give you a problem, I'll tell you what it is. But I have to tell you which one of these cases I'm concerned about. Okay? And they, they test for different things. Okay, so this is the um, testing error that I, that I talked about. So, right, the, the whole underlying the idea of hypothesis testing is there's a risk of making a, a bad decision. Right? If you want no risk of making a bad decision, don't make any decisions at all. But if you want to make decisions, you might make a bad one. The bad ones are measured by these two errors. One of them we directly specify. Right? When we do the hypothesis test, we choose alpha. That's the probability that you reject a true hypothesis. That's a design variable, if you will. We choose that. But there's another hypothesis, there's, there's another error, which I already introduced verbally at least, called beta. It's the, pr it's the probability that you'll accept a false hypothesis. And these kind of things are kind of competing with each other, as I'll show you in a moment. Okay? So sometimes this is called a type 1 error and this is called a type 2 error. But I usually just call them alpha and beta. Okay? So this table here tells you it's kind of obvious, but it says, so here, let's say you're doing a hypothesis test and you're concerned about the idea that the, the hypothesis is that the value, so th 
theta here is any value of any distribution you're interested in. Let's just talk about the mean to make it simple. So you're saying, I think the mean is equal to mu naught. I'm worried about the mu being something other than, that'd be a two-sided alternative. I'm worried about it being some value that's not mu naught, like mu one, okay? All right, so the idea here is that if, if the value is, so there's a probability, let's say you take this to be 5%, okay? then there's a 95% probability that the thing will be true and you'll conclude it's true. Okay, that's what you meant when you specified alpha. 95% probability that the underlying hypothesis is true and that you'll, know, that you'll find out it's true. There's unfortunately a 5% probability that the underlying hypothesis is true, but you'll think it's not. Okay, that's the value alpha that you specified. Okay, corresponding to this is that you, even though you don't specify this, there is something called beta here. You don't specify it, but it can be calculated. That um, you, the actual value might be not equal to the value you've hypothesized, and you conclude that. That'll be one, the probability of that'll be one minus beta. Okay, but beta is not something you can choose. <laughs> but once you choose alpha and you choose a number of samples, beta is going to be something that you can be calculated. We don't, I don't show you how to calculate it, but the book does. But I can just tell you, as you make alpha small or number of samples small, beta grows, okay? So again, over here, the hypothesis is false and you know it's false. That's why we call it a true decision. You made the right decision. The probability of that's gonna be one minus beta, okay? So ideally, beta is gonna be small, right? Because the chance of, then the chance of this happening will be high. And there's the other possibility that the hypothesis is not true, but you think it is true. That's a so-called type two error. The probability of that occurring is beta. So two different errors, right? This is the error that the, the hypothesis is um, <laughs> true, but you don't think so. And then there's this error. The hypothesis is not true, but you think it is, okay? You specify alpha, so you have complete control over that. Beta, unfortunately, you don't, okay? And if you try to make alpha really, really small, you'll make beta really, really big. So if you say, I only want there to, it seems like fool's gold, right? I, I, I want there to be a 99.999% probability that I'm correct, right? That I won't reject a true hypothesis, okay? The problem is then the beta will get really big and there'll be like a 75% chance you'll accept a false hypothesis. So it's, it's not, doesn't come for free, all right? All right, so these are conflicting, um, right? It says, I already said this, a significant level, as the significance level alpha decreases, right? Probability of rejecting a true hypothesis, beta will increase. And your chance of accepting a false hypothesis increases. So it's not, you, that's why you don't choose alpha to be ridiculously small, because if you do, you make beta too big. So that's why people kind of think, you know, alpha five or 10% is usually a reasonable value. And you might imagine beta also depends on the number of samples. If the number of samples is small, the possibility of you doing something wrong is increased. Hopefully you get that idea from statistics, right? If I want to make a decision about thin film and I measure two of them, then the chance of making a wrong decision are, are high. The more samples I get, the better decision making will be. The reason we don't sample too much is because sampling is expensive, right? So what are they trying to show in this particular test? They're trying to show that in this picture, basically, if you want to shrink, th this is nice because it shows the beta probability and the alpha probability. So if you want to make alpha smaller, then this C value will move this way and beta will grow bigger. <laughs> okay, so it's just, just the way it is. So that's why we don't pick alpha to be really small and we don't tend to calculate beta, but the book shows you how, if you're interested, it shows you how to calculate it. It's a little bit complex than I thought a little bit beyond the scope, but you just have to be aware that this is, this is at play here. All right, so now we're gonna talk about how to do the um, testing, which we've kind of already alluded to. Um, the test for a mean distribution. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna assume normal distributions like we always do, and then I'm gonna tell you how to perform a one hypothesis test on the mean and then I'm gonna teach you how to do a hypothesis test on the variance. And in each case, I'll give you an example, okay? And then we'll be done again, it'll be coffee time, all right? 
All right, so here's the idea. Um, you have n samples. These are random samples. So you measured x1, x2, and x up to xn. And you're, inter you're interested in this case uh, for a left-handed test. So these methods vary a little bit depending on what test you're, what alternative you're using. So the alternative I'm using now is this one. I'm worried about it being the actual mean being too s smaller than the hypothesized value. Okay. You can come up with tests for that case and this case too, but I don't, I don't show them here. They're in the book. Okay. It would just be boring if I showed you all permutations of these things. All right. So this is our hypothesis. The mean is equal to some value mu naught. Uh, our alternative is that the mean is actually equal to something called mu one, which is less than mu naught. So this is most likely what we want, and this is what we don't want. Okay? We choose some significance level called alpha. So 5% is typical. We compute the observed value of this t statistic as this. So we take the samples, compute the mean. That's the sample mean. We take the samples, compute the sample variance, s squared. And then we compute the t statistic here. Take the mean that we calculated from the sample, subtract off the hypothesized mean, divide by the standard deviation, and, the squ and then actually multiply, if you will, because that's divided in the denominator, um, by the square root of the number of samples. Okay? And then what we want to do is find the critical value of C from the table for this number of degrees of freedom, and we're interested in what's the probability the T statistic will be less than C, right? Because we're interested in the left, that left-hand test. We want to find that critical value C equals alpha. I already showed you, and I'll show you again, you, it's, you can't get this directly. You can get one minus alpha and then go from there. I'll show you again. All right, so you pick out this critical value C, and again, the, uh, cri the critical idea of the critical value is that it divides up the t t t observed T values into those that are so improbable we think the hypothesis is not true to those that are accepted, okay? So the key here is really finding the C value, typically, because computing this is not hard. It's quite easy. So if the t, uh, t statistic that we calculate from the samples is greater than the critical value, accept the hypothesis, otherwise reject it. Okay? So let's go through another simple example here. All right, so let's say we have molecular, we have some polymer, okay? We are making polymer, and so we've taken 10 samples, which isn't said up here, but anyway, it is said here implicitly. We've taken 10 samples and we've measured the molecular weight of the polymer. There's different molecular weights, but let's not worry about that. So, and these are all scaled by 10 to the minus fifth, meaning a typical molecular weight is about one times 10 to the plus fifth, because polymers have a high molecular weight, okay? I just didn't feel like writing 10 to the fifth times everything. So there's the mean value, and there's the standard deviation, okay? And the idea is that we are, let's say, selling this polymer to someone, and we have a contract with them that says we will make polymer that has molecular weight 1.3 times 10 to the fifth. Okay? That's what we promised them we would provide. And they're worried not too much about whether the molecular weight is too high, but they're worried about whether the molecular weight's too low. Because maybe it's polyethylene, if molecular weight's too low, you can't injection mold it or whatever, however they want to process the polymer. Okay? So this is what we do. Okay? So the idea is we might have made um, you know, 10,000 pounds of this polymer that we're going to ship to them. And we've taken 10 samples of the polymer, taken it to a laboratory, measured the molecular weight, got that mean and standard deviation. Now we want to know whether we're going to ship them the whole 10,000 pounds or not. At the end, I'll tell you what to do with 10,000 pounds of polymer if you don't ship it to the people. <laughs> okay, we'll get that right down here. All right, so that's the, that's the problem, okay? So we're going to choose a significance level of 10%. It was 5% before, now it's 10% because I just wanted to give you a different value so you could see a different value taken out of the table. But, so this may be some contracted uh, agreement that this is the significance level we'll choose. I didn't say it here, but there's 10 samples. Degree of freedom is n minus 1, so there's 9 degrees of freedom for this problem. All right? So again, I can't actually find the value. So what I really want to do is find this right here. Okay? But the problem is that thing is 0.1, and 0.1 is not in the table. So what I'm going to do is find the probability for 0.9, okay? 
and I'll call that critical value C, C tilde. Okay, because as I recall, the table starts at 0.5 and then goes up to one. You can't find values less than a half. Okay, so I can't find what I want, but I can find this. I find the, prob the probability out of the table one minus alpha 90%. So I want the probability to be 90%. Uh, degrees of freedom is nine, and if I look in the table, I'll find that's the that's the corresponding z value, which I called c tilde. Okay, and the reason this is useful is because the t distribution is symmetric. Okay, and therefore if I know the value for 0.9, I know the value for 0.1 is minus that number. Okay, so I find it for the probability of 0.9 and then for it to be the value I actually want, which is 0.1, which is not in the table, just minus that. You can use this always. Okay, you can always use this idea. In fact, you always have to. So I find that the critical value is 0.138. So just to further annoy you, I'll do this again. I got in trouble for this once by the students. Okay, so in this case, the critical value there is 1 .3, minus 1.38. So we're going to compute the t-statistic, and then it's either going to lie over there, and we're going to accept the hypothesis, or it's going to lie to the left, and we're going to reject it. Pictures are nice. That's why I keep flipping back and forth. All right, so we have the mean. It's been calculated from the samples already. So we take the, the x bar, subtract o off the hypothesized mean, which is 1.3, divide by the standard deviation, which is um, right the square root of the variance. I did it right this time, yay. Divide by the number of samples, square root, which is 10. You'll get this value here, okay? 1.897, and that's less than the critical C value. That means it's to the left. That means we don't believe this hypothesis, which is most unfortunate. <laughs> because now we have 10,000 pounds of polymer the customer doesn't want, okay? So you might ask, well, what do we do with that 10,000 pounds of polymer? Well, find another customer in a different country. Um, I'll say no more, <laughs> okay? There'll be someone in the world that'll take that polymer. Okay, the other thing people do is they take the polymer and blend it with good polymer, right? So if you had polymer that had a little hi too high, the problem with this molecular weight, it looks like it's a little bit too low, right? So if you, if you had some polymer that had molecular weight too high, just mix them together. Get 20,000 pounds of good polymer. That's, that's perfectly legitimate, right? Nothing wrong with that. If you make some really horrendous polymer, put it in a landfill, okay? But normally you would, you would try to recover this. But the idea is you have a contract. Once this test fails, you can't, you can't ship that to them. So you got to do something else. All right. Okay, so now um, the the question is how to do test on the variant. So, so same kind of thing here. You have n samples. Typically for variants, you only do a right-handed test. In other words, if somebody is making a product and they say, uh, guess what? The variability is less than I thought. You're like, that's fine because variability is bad. <laughs> okay. So we're only worried about if the variability is too high, not if it's too low. Okay, so that's why typically for variance you're only interested in a right-handed test. Okay, that means we're going to assume that this is the var um, assumed variance. This is hypothesized variance, sigma zero squared, and the alternative is the variance is too high. It's higher than the hypothesized value. This is what we fear: too much variability. Not we don't fear too little. Okay. So as usual, we take our samples, compute the mean from the samples, and from the mean you can calculate the uh, sample variance, S squared. Cal su specify significance level, you know, 10%, 5%, typical thing. Okay. Now you have to use the chi-squared distribution, right? Because I argued before, it wasn't really much of an argument, it was more of a statement that for testing the variance and the mean, we use the T distribution. For the variance, we use the chi-squared distribution. So this is what we're looking for. It's a right-handed test, so we are trying to compute the probability that the observed value of the t-statistic will be greater than some critical value c. That probability is called alpha. We want to find the value c there. Okay. But as usual, <coughs> we won't usually be able to find that, but we will be able to find the following, the probability that it's less than th that, which is 1 minus right. So if, if this if this random variable, the probability of it being greater than c is alpha, the probability that it's less than or equal to c is 1 minus alpha. Okay. And the point is, this is what you can find in the table, and then you can use that to find the c value I'll show you. 
Okay? All right, so now you've got this critical value, right? So as usual, you've got your normal distribution there, and you've got some values way out to the right along the tail that are going to be rejected, otherwise they're going to be accepted. That's defined by the critical value C here for coming out of the table. And now you're going to compute, um, well, actually I lied. The critical value is actually not directly that thing. It's actually computed from that thing. Okay? So the critical value is computed as follows. You take your hypothesized value for the variance. You take the C value that came out of the table. And you take the number of samples and you compute the C star. The C star is the critical value. Okay. So in other words, for the, for the test we did before, the critical value came out of the table. Now that you get, you've used a value in from the table to compute the critical value, call it C star. So if our sample variance is less than this critical value C star, you accept the hypothesis, variability is OK. If it's greater than C star, you reject the hypothesis, too much variability. OK? All right, let's see how that works. And then, yeah, we're done. I've started adding more slides. I've erred way on the side of providing too much clear information at too low a speed. I need to go back to my old model. Far too much information at far, far too much velocity. OK. Um, we'll see. All right, so same, same example here. Um, now, first of all, based on the experience you had in the past when we talked about confidence intervals, you should, you should realize that you know, anything having to do with the variance is harder than with the mean. Like when we calculated confidence intervals on the variance, they were usually really wide. And so, and you know, we only have 10 samples here. So, as you, you know, we're specifying an alpha. When I'm telling you there's an underlying beta here, the beta is probably pretty big. I don't know what it is for this case. Remember, beta is the idea that the hypothesis is not actually true, but we'll think it is. And um, anyway, so there we go. There's the sample mean, there's the sample variance. Here's our hypothesis. Okay. This is pretty near the, the sample one, so I bet it's going to be true, right? So our hypothesis is this is the underlying <coughs> I hate myself. It's a little too strong perhaps. But how about a little squared on that guy? Right? That needs to right, that's the that's the sample variance. The true variance is sigma naught squared. Oh uh, let me look at something, people. Hold on. I see multiple errors. I've never liked myself less than right now. OK. Um, I'm kidding. I like myself plenty. All right. So, um, all right. So that should be squared, and that should be squared, and that should be squared, and God only knows what else should be squared. All right. I'll fix that. Those should all be squared. They all should be variances, not standard deviations. So, Sample variance is that, hypothesized variance is this, okay? The alternative that we're worried about is the variance squared is greater than what we think it's hypothesized to be, okay? So we're going to choose a significance level of 5% because we want to, because that's what we agreed to do. Degrees of freedom again will be n minus 1, which is 9. And so now we need to use the chi-squared distribution to calculate, right? We're looking for, for this number of degrees of freedom, when is the probability 5%? We want to find that value of the distribution, which we call C here, okay? The problem is you can't find that, but you can find this, okay? You can find that the probability, so again, if the probability of y being greater than c is 5%, the probability of being less than or equal to c is 95%. Okay. So, and that's what the cumulative, right, you're talking about a cumulative distribution. So, you can look up in the table, you can say, um, this is the probability 95%, degrees of freedom is 9, and then pick out this value of c directly from the table, it'll be, according to my picking it out, 16.92. Now calculate the critical value from this value. So you need the assumed uh, variance, which should be squared, which is that. The C value, which came out of the table, divide by the number of samples minus 1, which is 9. You get this value. Okay. And you can see this value here is less than that value, right? So this is the sample variance. This is the, vari this is the critical value of the variance. If this number is less than this number, you accept the hypothesis, otherwise you reject it. So in this case, variability is okay. It's low enough. 
you accept hypothesis that it's that. Okay? All right, well, I'm coming back with more material next time. So if you have any questions, I'll be up front, though.